Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Join Us Today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limli. We're on DTT because we're free to air. On DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 125, we are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, Parliament's Committee on Education to summon Education Minister to answer questions on inadequate food in many senior high schools. We have assets of the Joy News' as much anticipated hotline documentary, Empty Place, as it delves deeper into the grim picture of how the situation is pressurizing parents to adapt unorthodox ways of ensuring their wards do not go hungry. This is misinvesting. It was highly investing. Also this afternoon, pressure mounts on Ghana Shippers Authority to ensure shipping lines do not charge them importers and freight forwarders at the Tema port for extra demorages, rent and storage due to delays caused by the general internet disruption in the country. Plus, health experts in the Upper West region express worry over the increasing patient population of young people having chronic kidney diseases. We'll bring you details of all of these shortly. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and X Spaces at Joy News on TV. My personal handle is at Danana Aisha. Please do stay for details. <laughs> Ranking member on Parliament's Education Committee, Peter Nochukotoy, says his committee will send on Education Minister Dr. Say Duchum to answer questions in Parliament on the shortage of food on various SHS campuses. It follows Joy News' premiering of its much anticipated hotline documentary, Empty Plates, the free SHS promise, highlighting the acute shortage of food on many campuses across the country. The documentary presents a first hand insight into the grim nature of inadequate food in the schools and how parents are forced to adopt unorthodox ways of feeding their wards. We'll hear from Peter Nochukotoy shortly, but first, here are excerpts of the investigative piece by my colleague, Kwete Nate. To the online platform I had infiltrated, I discovered numerous complaints from school heads about weevil-infested maize bags supplied despite assurances from the free SHS coordinator that only a few bags were affected. My observations revealed several bags of maize being treated with neem tree leaves to ward off the pests. Given the critical food shortages, some school heads have conveyed to me their inability to discuss the contaminated maize as there's scarcely enough to feed the students. If you look at here, I, I, I want you to take I want you to take a view. This is maize infested. It was highly infested. So Someone advised us that we can use the name tree. So yesterday, we put it outside. The boys put it outside. And, they, and these were given to be fed to yes, the children. Yes, yes, free SHS. And so, oh, they are there a lot. So I was, I'm experimenting. So yesterday, we spread it on the, on the ground. We put the name tree upon it. And we are seeing some reduction in that sort. But is this the work of headmasters? The full documentary airs at 30 p.m. on the Join News channel. Meanwhile, Executive Director of Institute of Education Studies, Dr. Peter Anti, says he is not surprised about the current situation. These are evidence to support the assertions that some of us have known for years of the of the fact that there's there's serious food crisis in our senior high schools and that we need to take drastic measures to address these things. Not because anybody, as uh, the Honorable Member said, anybody is against the policy, but because there are tremendous effects of these uh, food shortages and nutritional challenges on the students, not in the, not in the immediate uh, 
time, but in the short to long term, the students would have serious challenges. And if we don't look at it from that perspective and find ways and means to address it, uh, we would not be doing these students any any good. So I was I was not surprised. I was very happy, and I'm happy again that we have this documentary out. I wasn't surprised that the ministry decided to even preempt the content of the of the documentary. So um, I was I was asking my my brother Kwesi, but saying that why why is he trying to preempt the content of the documentary by by releasing the statement? Well, ranking member on Parliament's Committee on Education, Peter Nochukotoy, says he doesn't understand why there should be shortage of food, given that the House has approved the budget for it. He says his committee will ensure the Minister of Education is summoned to provide answers to the situation at hand. As part of uh, budgetary allocations, we, as a committee first, the Estimates for the Ministry of Education are referred to the committee for the various uh, agencies. And the Free Senior High School Secretariat uh, comes under the ministry itself, and we approve budget. I remember last year, we approved 10 CDs, 10 Ghana CDs for every student, especially at the boarding uh, level that uh, that is what should be used to feed the students. But our information is that not all the 10 CDs goes to the school. Now, 70%, that is seven CDs, is kept by the school, sorry, by the ministry to buy the food items and supply to them. Uh, 3%, with 30%, which is three, Ghana cities is to be sent to the school. And as we talk now, for a very long time now, the schools have never received the full complement of the three Ghana cities per student. A school that may have about 5,000 or 3,000 students, they will just give after about 2,000 students and their balance uh, does not go. Now, what we are asking for is the decentralization of the process of the procurement or supply of food items. Yeah, as a committee, uh, we, uh, as part of our activities or oversight responsibility, uh, visited some schools. And uh, what we discovered was that the school authorities were not ready to open up to us for fear that uh, we will speak the truth and then they will be victimized. So they will tell you everything is okay, but when you interview students and uh, other staff, especially even at the uh, kitchen, they will tell you the real situation. And when we come back and we say this, the minister will promise us, oh, all is well. We have done A, B, C, D. We have now even set up a, a supply depots in all the regions. And the food is not going there in time and not in the right quantity as well. This afternoon, importers and freight forwarders at the Tema Port are asking the Ghana Shippers Authority to ensure shipping lines do not charge them for extra demurrages, rent and storage due to delays caused by the general internet disruption in the country. The general disruption in internet services across the country since last week has negatively affected the clearance of cargo at Ghana's largest seaport leading to demurrages, explaining the level of impact on the course of doing business at the port co-chairperson of the technical committee of the Tema district of the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders, Paulina Abroqua says they expect the Ghana Shippers Authority to intervene to ensure shipping lines do not take advantage to charge them extra for the de delays caused by the internet disruptions. I've been joined by Carlos Coloni, who has been monitoring this for us. Carlos, uh, what has been the conversation with these freight forwarders and the Port Authority on achieving this? All right, Aisha, uh, since morning I've been at the summer port, I've been to uh, many of the offices, and then you find a lot of these freight forwarders uh, stranded, and they are unable to clear their goods, 
uh, according to them, because of the disruption in the internet connectivity, they are unable to get onto the ICOMS platform to uh, you know, process their clearance and all that. They are also unable to pay money at the bank because of the internet issues, and this is really causing a lot of delays at the port. Currently, I am with the co-chairperson for the technical committee of the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders here in Tema, uh, Paulina Abrakwa, to share more light on the situation for us. So, uh, Paulina, paint a picture of the situation for us from Thursday to today. What has been the situation? Okay, thank you. So, um, from Thursday, especially Thursday, the situation was quite bad. We were mostly unable to submit our declarations and do, but as of Friday, for that aspect, with regards to the ICOM style working perfectly, except that, you know, there's a chain, okay? So once you go through your declaration, you have other stakeholders or service providers to deal with. So we mentioned the shipping lines, you can talk of the terminal. And for them, I mean, largely, we couldn't work. Some of the lines resorted to manual processes, but it was quite slow. Others, too, we couldn't renege on maybe using a manual process, and so nothing happened. So it caused, of course, a lot of delays, and um, delays with no results in cost, cost like demorage, like rent, like storage, and it's not been good. But as um, at this morning, um, of course, like I mentioned, ICOM has come, it's fully back, in fact, since Friday. Um, some of the lines um, have, still have challenges, okay, still have challenges. The bank on Friday was bad. Um, now it's better, but it's a bit slow. The bottom line is that still the delays persist largely. And so um, we are asking that if the shippers authority can take the lead, because they are the, um, the regulators when it comes this... to negotiation of, negotiation of freight and other things. For the, um, the Ghanaian traders, by traders I mean the importers and exporters. So they should take the lead and then ensure that this is a general situation that no trader, importer or exporter, have to pay for any extra cost or charge for the delays being experienced as a result of the internet issue. Okay, so Aisha, there you have it. And so they are just uh, expecting that the Ghana Shippers Authority would come and do something about the situation. Earlier on, I spoke with the uh, Executive Secretary of the Importers and Exporters Association in the person of Samson Asaki Awingobe who is asking that the economic, uh, economic management team should immediately come up with a plan B as now the uh, shipping lines are resorting to manual processes of doing things. So we are still monitoring the situation here at the summer port and we'll keep our viewers updated. Uh, Carlos, how, what has been the response from the shippers authority, I mean, with all of these uh, suggestions being made to them? Yes, yeah, so we've been uh, working the lines to get through to the uh, shippers authority. We've not been successful, but we are still pushing to see what they will be able to say about the situation. Because the fear for many of the freight forwarders here in Tama is that if this situation persists for the next five weeks, it means that they're really, really going to lose a lot of money. And so they are hoping the shippers authority will respond to their call and do something about the situation. Carlos Coloni is our man at the port. We'll definitely bring you more on this in our subsequent bulletins. Right now, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Jojieva, says it's time to take advantage of artificial intelligence for the benefit of all. Speaking at a panel discussion in Accra on the theme AI as a catalyst to transform the economies in sub-Saharan Africa, the IMF boss underscored the need for a conscious effort to prevent AI from being used to perpetuate and entrench the existing inequalities. We can see three, four, five percent productivity gain if we go forward with artificial intelligence effectively. So this is my first point. We desperately need something that would inject more dynamism in the world economy. Second, we also need to recognize that the scale of impact of artificial intelligence is gigantic. Uh, when we looked at the labor market's impact over the next years, in advanced economies, some six
low income countries 26%. So this is like a tsunami. We have to think how we can make the best out of it, prevent artificial intelligence instead of source of good to turn into a source of inequality, mm. misinformation, deep fakes, distortion in our lives. And on your election headquarters, chiefs and people of the OT region are being given the opportunity to make inputs in the next manifesto of the National Democratic Congress as the building Ghana tour makes a stop in that area. So far, 15 regions of the country have been visited by the former president, John Romani Mahama, who is also flag bearer of the NDC. He says he intends visiting all regions of the country to gain their views. First of the activities lined up in the region is a town hall meeting at Jasikan in the Boim constituency. Nanae Ojima, who is touring the area with the former president, joins us with more. Nanae Ojima, where are you right now? And what has the flag bearer been telling them? So presently, the former of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, is at the Boim constituency, and this place is the first stop that the building Ghana tour of the NDC is making as the OT region. Um, not long ago, the various groupings here, including trade union teachers, among others, had the opportunity to present their challenges to the flag bearer of the NDC. And also, um, the, the, the solutions were also prepared by these people. Before they had their turn, the traditional authority in this area was given the opportunity to also have his say. And according to the chief, uh, it's unfortunate that the present government has neglected the people of good constituency, especially the regional minister. He says that the regional minister has failed to give the same attention that he's given the other areas to the people of good. So he believes that it's about time that the government's attention is drawn to this challenge. After his speech, other people, other groupings had the opportunity to also speak. And now John Dramani Mahama is addressing the people. He has been addressing challenges that were raised by some of the people in the area of education. He believes that it's about time. If um, it's successful in um, taking a comeback, he will ensure that there is a platform where teachers and other stakeholders in the education sector will sit and look at areas like the free teachers, school feeding program, among others. Um, he, he continues to speak to the people and he's assuring them that his government will ensure that the challenges of the Ghanaian public is addressed. So John Dramani Mahama from here will move to the Biakwe constituency. From Biakwe, he will end at the Krachi East and West constituencies here in the OC region. And the tour will continue tomorrow. It's a two-day tour of the OT region. Man following the NDC flag bearer, who is currently in the OT region, will bring you more from that tour in our subsequent bulletins. Now, if you have the power to buy back a billion dollar property just to save an endangered animal, would you do that? Well, that is what the U.S. government did after it found that the over 25,000 hectare Pacuyan Strand State Forest in Florida had some few endangered species of panthers. It brings up the argument of what countries like Ghana, which have the power over its forests, are doing to save them and its wildlife from the effects of illegal mining. As part of the multimedia group's Media Corp with the U.S. Foreign Press Center, Erasmus Sassari Donko and Kofi Asari toured the Pakayun Strand Forest brought, uh, and brought back from private owners to save endangered Florida panthers. The Gulf of America Corporation, a development company, owned this 25,000 hectare forest land back in the 90s. 
the dark canals fixed some amenities ready to sell them to estate developers. But when the U.S. government weighed the importance of preserving some endangered animal species like the Florida panther, the red crocodile woodpecker, and the bald eagle, it decided to take action. Through the American constitutional provision known as the eminent seizure, it bought back the lands so to protect nature. So when did the government buy it back? Professor Wayne Everham is a professor at the Department of Ecology and Environmental Studies at Florida Gulf Coast University. So they built miles of canals on this landscape intending to also built roads intending to sell house lots and they went out of business and the state found the money to be able to buy the land back and now they're in the process to to put the land back to where it was before to allow it to fill up so there's a little a little deer track right next to what could be a bigger one or it could be the same little deer but it's probably a bigger one charlie vance a graduate student at the florida gulf coast university is monitoring the restoration of the wildlife and ecosystem here. So the primary restoration um, that happened here was hydrological, to restore uh, the water to the landscape, the hydrology, the natural flow of how it used to be on the peninsula. What we've done at FGCU really has been to track that restoration progress by uh, tracking how the water is moving throughout the landscape. There's a lot of species on this plant, on this landscape. There's a um, a diverse grouping. Um, you can see the amount of birds, wading birds here. There's uh, several species of frogs, reptiles. There's at least four endangered species that I know of here: the panther, um, the red cockaded wood, wood woodpecker, the wood stork. And there's the uh, fox squirrel. Um, there's there's such a wealth of life here, and it's really worth protecting. The thing about this place, about the Picayune, about the restoration, is if you look backwards 20 years, this already was paved. And now they've pulled up the pavement and filled in the canals they were using to drain the wetlands. Professor Wynne Everham explains the importance of maintaining at least some of our green ecosystems for generations to come. We have to figure out how we can put homes and still protect places like this, either just for our spirit, that it, that it nurtures us to spend time in the natural world, or we can be very pragmatic about it. You know, those woods help hold back our water, help treat our water, help recharge our aquifers. The things that natural systems do benefit us. And sometimes we don't pay attention to that. So we think, wouldn't it be better to put a parking lot there? And the answer is no, not there. There are other places we can put parking lots. So what do I say to people? I, we, we should be thinking farther if we can than um, next week, next year. We should be thinking about our kids and our grandkids. And what is, what is the place that we want to build for them, that we want to leave for them? So here in Florida, the government thought it wise to save endangered wildlife in 25,000 hectares of forest. We in Ghana have the right over the land. We have the power to say no to mining in forest reserves and biodiversity areas. The power is in our hands. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Picayune Strand Forest, Florida, USA. Let, let's come back here to Ghana and stop at the Upper West region because physician specialist and head of medicine and therapeutic at the Upper West Region Hospital, Dr. Nabil Dikwe, has expressed worry over the increasing patient population of young people having chronic kidney disease. This he attributes to the new lifestyle where young people have resorted to the use of herbal concoction to enhance their sexual performance. Dr. Nabil Dikwe made the statement at the World Kidney Day celebration in WA. World Kidney Day is a global health awareness campaign focused on the importance of the kidneys 
and reducing the frequency and impact of kidney disease and its associated health problems worldwide. As part of celebrations to mark the day in the Upper West region, a one-day capacity building workshop was held by the Upper West Region Hospital aimed at equipping nurses from the hospital and other health facilities in the region with the needed education on how to manage patients at their facilities. It is also to educate health workers and the general public on the use of certain medications to reduce the risk of kidney impairment. Physician specialist and head of the Department of Medicine and Therapeutic at the Upper West Union Hospital, Dr. Nabil Dikpe, disclosed that the number of persons with kidney diseases in the Upper West Region and that requires the service of dialysis are on the rise pegging the figure to around 60. Currently, we have over 60 patients on dialysis in the region, you know, and these patients have dialysis on the average about twice a week. Ideally, it's supposed to be three times a week, but uh, because of financial constraints, most of them are having dialysis about twice a week. And since the unit was open, we've had over 600 sessions of, of, of dialysis in, in total. So it's a big issue. And we, and we also keep seeing a lot of patients who come with kidney impairment. That is reversible. So there are some of them, we call that acute kidney AKI. So they come in, some of them come in really bad. They need dialysis. We dialyze them a few times. Kidneys recover 100%. And they go home without requiring, without requiring that dialysis. Dr. Nabil Pencil's three risk factors are some of the causes of kidney diseases. Listen it with an advice. The number one risk factor in Ghana is hypertension, followed by diabetes. You know, and it's a big issue. So we keep talking about people um, going to the health, health facilities to check their blood pressures, people checking their sugars. Those who have been diagnosed with hypertension and diabetes should take their medication seriously because these two are the top two causes or risk factors for, for chronic kidney disease, you know. And now we've observed that we are also seeing a lot of chronic kidney disease in young people. And we believe it's, it's as a result of some lifestyle practices. So you have a lot of young people taking all sorts of herbal concoctions, you know, to enhance their sexual performance. So people take all, all kinds of herbal products. And these herbal products uh, potentially can affect the functions of the kidney. So we see a lot of young people coming with kidney impairment. And I, I know that currently the, there are studies ongoing within the country to look at the effect of some of these drugs on, on the market. Uh, but we would advocate for young people to, to desist from such herbal concoctions that are purported to improve sexual function because eventually it damages the kidneys. And the cost of requiring dialysis is, is crazy. Medical director of the Upper West Region Hospital, Dr. Robert Amesie, urged the staff of the hospital to exhibit professionalism in their field of work. For the first, those of us who began this hospital, for the first 10 years, let's run it like a hospital that when somebody's relative is here, you don't need to be calling every minute. And so what is happening? And what is happening? But we will have what we call a culture that it doesn't take Dr. Nabil or Dr. Robert or Dr. Katiba or Dr. Latif or Dr. Anzara for something to work. It just takes anybody that you go and meet in the hospital knows that. Once you are a patient, this is the kind of service you deserve, and this is what we are going to do for you. And I think that is what we are doing now. A couple of years ago, management of the Upper West Region Hospital, under the leadership of Dr. Robert Amesia, established this dialysis unit to cater for patients who either too used to go for dialysis outside the region. I am currently at the dialysis unit of the Upper West Region Hospital. Uh, you can see that there are three machines here that are really uh, functioning. But the number of people that they have to take care of is very large. I'm told that they have as many as 60 patients that have to come here. You know, each session of a dialysis session has to take at least uh, four hours. So clearly means that the people have outnumbered the machines right here. Apart from the patients outnumbering the dialysis machines, head of the dialysis unit of the hospital, Urusa Daniel, lamented that they have several thousands of unpaid bills to deal with. He called for support from benevolent organizations and individuals to help them acquire more machines and also defray the debts of patients. Truly, spe truly speaking, the major challenge we are facing here is the patients are here because of lack of money most of them complaints of finances and that boils down to the reason why they find it difficult
to come and assess dialysis. If not, they are ready to come for dialysis because that is their life-saving mode. But they are not able to come just purposely because of lack of funds. And we also have to do with, yes, we have increasing number of patients day in, day out. But we just have three functioning machines. So probably we are appealing to all benevolent societies if they can come to our aid by providing us with a support on providing the machines or machines to support the unit. Then as well as the cost of uh, consumables to set up a dialysis unit is not easy. It's, 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 it's too much. So if people uh, can come to our aid by supporting us with the consumables, I think it would be very helpful. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wa. We're still live on Joy News today, and we're coming to you from our studios in Kokom Limli. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll bring you business. A great afternoon to you and a warm welcome to the business segment on Join News Today with me, Pius Kojo Baka, flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Dramani Mahama, has promised to commit to promotion of women-owned financial institutions if voted into power. The move is one of the strategies aimed at bridging the financial inclusion gap. Now, according to him, available statistics have shown widening gender inequality despite growth in the financial sector. He was speaking at a meeting with some players in the fintech industry. The next the NDC government shall bridge the gender gap in financial inclusion. It is worrying that the gender gap between females and males continue to widen, notwithstanding Ghana's level of financial inclusion. For example, according to the Global Findex report, in 2014, the financial inclusion gender gap was 3% more males, male access than female. That is even at the service end. I'm talking about the service and, and within the industry itself. This inequality gap increased to 8% in 2017 and went up again in, to 11% in 2021. This trend is unacceptable and needs urgent attention if we are to put Ghana on the path of sustained and inclusive development. Considering that women form almost 51% of the population and own about 44% of micro and small and medium enterprises that const and constituting about 92% of businesses in Ghana, their inclusion, the exclusion from financial services could undermine our economic development efforts. We're also thinking to complement this to revive a women's bank. Remember, we had the World's Women uh, Bank and it has since collapsed. And so we're looking to bring a specialized bank that's addresses this gender gap. Let me assure you that the next NDC government will promote women-owned financial institutions, focusing on women-owned businesses and promoting financial inclusion amongst them. It takes more than microloans to empower women-owned businesses and promote sustainable and inclusive growth. In more business news, procurement practitioners have been urged to stay away from corrupt activities. According to law professor George Kwashi, this is largely affecting Ghana's economy and must be addressed. Speaking to Joy Business at the launch of a book titled An Appraisal of Ghana's Public Procurement Regime, he said corporates should be prosecuted. The book offered by Michael and George Kwashi called for an urgent review of procurement processes in Ghana. Mr. Kwashi said, a stringent policy is key to ensuring value for money and accountability of government spending. Many jurisdictions have tried to regulate the practice of procurement. This is because this is an area where large volumes of money is spent. And if you don't regulate it properly, then there will be loopholes through which national revenue can see and that kind of stuff. Let's put it this way. The challenges facing procurement uh, practice in Ghana basically hinges around single source procurement. 
in the sense that there are specific provisions in Axis history which tells us how we are supposed to play and before one can use that method of procurement and that kind of stuff. But more often than not, procurement practitioners do not stick to this rule. They want to cut corners and all that kind of stuff. But if you are going to achieve the aim of value for money, then we need to you, um, treat these provisions very seriously. They must be enforced. We must not just take them as a series of suggestions. Oh, you may do this. It's not me. The book titled An Appraisal of Ghana's Public Procurement Regime details key areas to be tackled to addressing procurement infractions. Good afternoon. Time now to bring you sports on your news today with me, Muftaro Nabila Abdullah Benjamin Azamati, one hit five of the ongoing African Games at the Legon Sports Stadium just a couple of hours ago. He did a time of 10.54 seconds to reach the semi final of the competition. And the likes of Safo Ansa as well as Banabas again all reached the semi final of the men's 100 meters event. The, semi-final would be happening later this evening at about 4.45 p.m. So you would want to go to the Legon Sports Stadium and follow all the track and field events as they get underway uh, at the Legon Sports Stadium. In the women's division, uh, the likes of uh, uh, Mary Boache, uh, Ho Haliti have all made it to the semi-final of the women's 100 meters as well. For the 200 meters, they will be happening in the evening. Now, let's hear from Benjamin Azamata. Prior to uh, this race, he had spoken about how he and his colleagues are here to fly high the flag of Ghana. I would like to say um, we are all very much prepared. Um, having been here from Monday, um, seeing everything that's going on, um, seeing the practices and everything, I think um, you're ready. I mean, since last year, we've had it at the back of our mind that the African Games is going to be hosted in Ghana, and so we had to prepare and come here to be able to, you know, run fast and represent the country well as well as, well as winning laurels for our country. So um, I would say basically the whole team is prepared, the whole team is ready to um, hit the tracks tomorrow and to do what we do is to be able to put out our best performances and also win medals for our country. Meanwhile, um, high jumper uh, Rushi Obua, who initially was not part of Team Ghana's uh, squad for this month's African Games, she's back. She's a record holder in the uh, high jump with 1.94 meters, uh, a jump she did in August last year. She, so she's a potential gold medalist for Ghana in this year's African Games. Now let's hear from uh, one coach who has already secured four uh, medals and he's now hoping to uh, move them from bronze medals to silver and gold medals. Coach Ofori Asari of uh, Ghana's Black Bombers. He says uh, that uh, his team has got what it takes to win more medals for Ghana. Well, I think uh, they are doing marvelously well. They are responding to uh, all the training that we've gone through. And when you train, the most important thing is you have to get the results. And I, I'm seeing something like that. And I hope we'll go further to be able to do more. We have a female and male team. We know very well that our female team is not uh, strong. But we believe that we can build them for a better future. So um, if we are able to get medal at the female, fine. We'll, we'll, if not, we'll encourage them for another. Time. But for men, there's no way we are going to get medal. More. More medals? Yeah. For how many? More, more. Let's talk about the individuals. We saw Henry Malm yesterday. There were some complaints about his defenses and how he didn't seem to have the momentum. What's the issue with him? Is it the, the ring rusts? No, Henry, Henry Mam went to professional and has been professional for some time. Now he has to adjust to the amateur. The speed in the amateur is different from the professional. So it's just a matter of time. It's good that he wins. And if he continues winning and continue training, I think the speed will come and everything will be okay.
Yeah, we've seen some of the chief fights now. A few people also raised concerns about his defences and how they seem to be a bit erratic and wasn't really in control of his defences like that. Is that something to worry about? Or was yeah, for, now, for now, like I just said, I'm at his speed. You don't have that. You don't need. You don't get time to think. So you you must you must do it from uh, up and down. You say you must explode. You must explode. Explosiveness in amateur is very very important. So uh, you, you, your, your thinking must be in your style. If you want to relax and think before you see, you lose. So uh, 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 they ask for defense. He has the defense, and he knows what to do when the time comes. But this is amateur boxing. We so need to, uh, develop, to be explosive and speed. Just to conclude, you've seen our opponents. I picked out Frank Mombe, the, the Gabonese. Is there anyone that you've seen that you think will be a threat to the Ghana team or by killing everyone? Well, every, every country that is here is a threat because they've all prepared. And this is boxing. Boxing is a sport that has no respect for the master. So it doesn't matter who you are, even professionals come here and they lose. So uh, it's a sport that has no respect for the master. So um, we just have to be very careful and keep on working very hard. That is it. If you want to follow the African Games, make sure you follow us on all our social media handles as we give you every single update from every single center in this month's African Games. And if you want to go to the Legon Stadium to watch track and field, the evening events will be starting at 4.15 p.m. You can come to the Joy FM front desk and pick a ticket. Joy Sports has about 250 tickets we are giving away to supporters. So just come, pick one, and go out there and watch and throw your weight behind Ghanaian athletes. That's your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. Up next is World News. And sign up for showbiz. The Joy FM East Income Adventure was a whirlwind of excitement and fun for our patrons, with many of them yearning for more. The tour, which marked a celebration of Ghana Month, was packed with endless fun with a lot of activities like dance competition, movie nights, visits to a cinema waterfalls, Konfanochi's hometown, Ukugwa, and the Safari Valley Echo Park. Our patrons, including our oldest adventurer, are already eager for more. Max Olagbagba has more. Scores of our patrons are circling a bonfire and singing Jama songs. Saturday night turned into Sunday morning filled with dance competitions, quizzes about Ghana, plus fun challenges. Many of them won beautiful wooden fabrics as prizes. We are finally here um, at our campsite um, where our patrons are going to have a lot of fun. There's going to be bonfire with jammer session, there'll be cocktail, there'll be barbecue, there'll be movie nights, there'll be dance competition and a lot of prizes to be won by our patrons. They are pumped up for a lot of fun. Meet retired Liberian and the oldest member of the group, Mary Akofu. She's 74. She's one of the people taking part in the JAMA session. She says Joy FM's credibility as a media house is the reason she does not miss any event organized by the station. When there is news breakout, Joy will be the first. And when you hear news on Joy, it is the truth. Yeah. You wouldn't have to cross-check before. And because I'm an information officer, I always prefer making sure I pass on information which is correct. Yeah. As I wrap up the bulletin this afternoon, my name is Aisha Prime. Log on to myjournline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.